so the uh, final talk for this afternoon um, is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Greg Jimino from the NIH, and he's going to talk about promising new therapies in the next decade and beyond. And following that, we'll have an open forum in which all the speakers today will sit at the front and we'll take all the uh, questions that have been posed by all the audience. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, York, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. So we're going to try to see if, if we can use this with a mouse. He's trying to hook it up right now. We'll see how this works. Or don't move the mouse. <laughs> there we go. And can you see the mouse? There we go. So we're going to see if I don't move, if I don't drop it. So the title of the talk is Getting Back to Normal. I thought that would be get Promising New Therapies for ADPKD in the Next Decade and Beyond. And I thought it's kind of a fitting topic uh, post-COVID. We're trying to get back to normal as, as a community. And I think in this case, we're probably, of course, trying to keep kidney function, uh, reverse if we can even, any underlying cystic disease. So, whoops, sorry. Yeah. I've got to be two-handed here. This is going to be a real challenge. Here we go. Let's try this. We may have to. Uh, now it nothing works. Okay, we're gonna have B sign. Let's do this. Unfortunately, it's hard for me to see it, my vision. Well, we're going to do it by uh, the wheel. This is going to be really difficult. We'll try this. It's going to be a challenge. So just some relevant disclosures. I'm a federal official, so I have nothing to, to declare, but my spouse, Terry Watnick, does. Um, and then I'm going to go through very, very briefly some drugs. I'm just going to mention them very, very. Actually, I'm just going to show them on the slide. These are not have been approved for PKD, but I just want to make sure that is a disclosure. So some learning objectives, I want to hopefully understand the opportunities and challenges in developing effective therapies for ADPKD. You'll be able to distinguish between treatments that are based on downstream pathways that we've heard quite a bit about today um, versus root cause of disease, and I'll spend a little bit of time thinking about that with you. And then thirdly, learning about recent discoveries that could result in new therapies in the future. There's been a couple of interesting studies that have come out over the last year or two. So this is the problem we're trying to address. This is from a report that came out in 2014 from Europe, where they looked at the incident rate of renal replacement therapy and the age over the decades uh, in five-year intervals, uh, intervals from, two, from 1990 through 2010. And what's really, really striking is that in that 20-year interval, despite all of our therapies, all of our best care, including ACE and ARBs, there really had been no change in the age at which people, again, started in kidney uh, renal replacement therapy before the age of 50. Now, the, there is change in the later years, and there's a lot of different factors that contribute to that, including the fact that older people were now being dialyzed and they hadn't been in prior years. But what was really striking is that nothing had changed in those early on, in the earlier, you know, more severe cases. And so now we'll see, fast forward five or 10 years from now, whether the shifts with the onset of, uh, with the initiation of tolvaptin as a therapy in individuals. We'll take some time to see that, and hopefully we'll see some shift, but it's clear there's a really big need to still impact on those who are most severely affected. And even those, when they develop end-stage kidney disease in their 70s or 80s, it's still difficult. We know transplant's not a great option for those folks. Whoops, that was a mistake. And we're gonna, nope. We're gonna try this again, no. Doesn't like that. Ah. I can't get out of it with, can anybody see it? Yeah. What does it say? Next, here we go. The top, next one. There we go. Okay. Sorry. So 
PKD provides, presents some opportunities and challenges. The big opportunity, of course, it's got a very, in general, it's a fairly slowly progressive disease over the course of decades. In fact, we can identify many people, even prenatally, uh, by testing uh, whether they are at risk of having a, the disease. So that really means that we have a whole long period of time where we can do an intervention and slow, perhaps uh, stop the progression of disease and maybe even prevent the disease in the first place. But that also poses challenges, as we've heard, because anything that we have to give may have to be given over a long period of time. And so we have to think about side effects, complications, durability of therapy, uh, compliance, as we just heard. It's sometimes a challenge, particularly those therapies that are more demanding on lifestyle changes. And so this is, this is, the, this is the challenge in ADPKD, is finding therapies that can be really effective that actually can and be hopefully intervene in the early course of disease and not have a lot of untoward effects that are going to basically uh, keep you know do more harm than good over the course of a lifetime of an individual. We've already heard about another factor that we have to consider, and that is, of course, the innate uh, variability in the clinical presentation of the disease. If we look, as we heard, on a population level, people with PKD1 tend to de develop end-stage kidney disease you know, a decade or so earlier than people with PKD2. And uh, we know that, again, so genetic locus, heterogeneity, is certainly a one factor. But as we heard from Dr. Pei earlier, that isn't predictive on a given individual basis, unfortunately. Great for population, not so great for an individual. We also know that the nature of the mutation can also change the disease severity. In general, truncating mutations, which are shown here in blue for PKD1, again, earlier onset and stage kidney disease. Missense changes in PKD1, kind of an intermediate phenotype in general between PKD1 truncating and PKD2 changes. But again, missense changes. There's a whole spectrum of different types of effects, functional consequences of missense changes. Some result in a loss, complete loss of function. And some of them are very, very mild hypomorphic changes. And so again, just knowing the sequence is not enough per se, to predict the variability. But yet, nonetheless, this variability is an important factor in thinking about how to set up clinical studies, to test therapies, or to even advise about giving therapies. And of course, we heard there's other factors that we have not yet really completely controlled for. We know that there's genetic modifiers, some that have been shown, others almost certainly yet to be discovered. And probably one of the other things that we really we have no good way of controlling for, and that is the timing and the frequency of that stochastic process of somatic hits. This is, again, I think an important factor that contributes to disease severity and probably accounts for why if you have more cysts, as identified by the imaging modalities, likely predicts a more severe outcome, even perhaps better than uh, volume per se. So thinking about therapeutic strategies, I think kind of bundle them into two classes, those that target downstream pathways, and we've had or heard a lot about that, and I'll just say a little bit about that today, and then secondly, those that target the underlying gene defect. So to begin with, the targeting downstream pathways. So most of what we know about pathways that are regulated or dysregulated in the context of ADPKD come from studies of cystic tissue, either human clinical material or else from our preclinical models. And, and, and the types of things that we find that have been described in the literature really fall into a, bundle, a variety of different bundles. For instance, there's no question proliferation is a contributor to the disease. You can't have a renal tubular, which is maybe the size of a couple of human hairs, get to the size of a cyst, which can be you know, centimeters in, in diameter, with, by, without having proliferation, so an increase in the number of cells that line that, that segment. So proliferation is clearly a factor. But proliferation you know, is happening over the course of many decades, not typically over days and weeks. Apoptosis has been described as being upregulated in cystic tissue. But we don't know if that's the is, is it protective or is it actually contributing to pathology? Is it the normal parenchyma that's getting squeezed and then just drops out? Or is apoptosis protecting us from an increased rate of cancer in ADPKD? Because as a disease that has proliferation going on for so many decades, it's surprising, and all the metabolic things that we heard from Dr. Watnick earlier today, it's surprising that there really isn't a significantly higher rate of cancer in ADPKD kidneys that results in clinically significant disease. We know there's a secretory phenotype. As you know, renal tubulars are typically absorptive. 99% gets refiltered, gets reabsorbed, it's filtered. And yet in this case, this is not a, a reabsorptive phenotype, right? These are balls of cysts, balls of fluid. So there's got to be a secretory component, particularly since they're often disconnected from the actual glomerulus and from the, the filtrate per se. 
If you look carefully at the renal tissue, it's obviously an, uh, an inflammatory response, in part driven by the epithelial, cystic epithelial cells themselves that are releasing cytokines and drawing inflammatory cells. And then lastly, when all of that resolves, there's fibrosis. And again, the fibrosis again correlates with, again, more severe uh, outcomes. And so you can, in fact, have a smaller kidney with worse GFR because you've replaced the, fibro the cystic component with fibrosis. So based on those abnormalities and looking at the pathways, there's been a host of pathways, as we've heard, that have been identified in this disease. Pathways, again, as highlighted on the slide here, include those focused on proliferation, those focused on met cell metabolism, those focused on the cyclic AMP pathways, we just heard from Dr. Torres, and, um, and, so the, and, 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 and pathways focused on fluid secretion. And for all of these targets, so in blue, is all the different targets that are either up or down regulated. Uh, in green are the drugs that are in various forms that have been identified or described that target these various pathways. So many, many pathways that are contributing to the path of pathology of ADPKD, and theoretically many, many different potential targets that we could look at as, uh, as factors to intervene in the progression of disease. One other thing just to highlight on this slide before I leave it, as you can see that these pathways are, have a lot of interconnected wiring. And so it makes it very difficult to necessarily predict what the outcome will be by any given intervention, or even a couple of interventions, because of the crosstalk between the different signaling pathways. So this is from clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, this is, again, a website in the United States, and it's used worldwide for tracking clinical studies. They have to be registered. Um, and on the left in each column is the intervention. So what is the drug or therapy? Uh, in the middle is the target of that drug or therapy listed. And then finally, the results that are in, if they're in clinicaltrials.gov uh, database. And it's just two, two uh, tables here. There's only one, as you can see here, highlighted in red, that has been shown to be effective and has been approved for clinical use, and that's tolvaptin. A lot of other therapies here particularly shown here if you look at the results section, where they may have had some benefits on growth, renal growth, but that's been disconnected from its effect on, on, on GFR or renal function. And in some cases, some of the drugs have actually had problems of toxicity where the, side, where the people couldn't tolerate the drug and so the drug had to be stopped. And so in fact, you know, uh, most of these have not been uh, effective in um, where they've been completed in slowing progression and improving or stabilizing kidney function. The one exception, again, is a metformin pilot study, small study. There was a little bit of a benefit in renal volume and a little bit of a benefit, I believe, in, uh, in kidney function, but it didn't reach statistical significance. And we don't know if it's just because of the variability or because the study size is just too small. And so a larger study would be required to show whether or not that really is beneficial. But these classes, these drugs, fall into a variety of different pathways that I just talked about, whether it's proliferation, whether it's fluid secretion, whether it's cyclic AMP, or whether it's uh, cellular metabolism. There's ongoing studies as well, a number of studies here uh, that, again, target different parts of various pathways, whether it's, again, proliferation pathways, NERF tube activator, which is, an, again, activating all the antioxidant pathways. Again, a re reactive oxygen species have been reported to be up in cystic tissue and a driver of disease. Um, a pro 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 provostatin, so, a, uh, again, a statin has been, again, reported in, in, a, in a small clinical study of kids to perhaps have some effect maybe on slow again, cystic growth. And then a, a novel therapy, a new class of therapy. I'll mention this a couple of times, and I'll come back to this. This is basically a small oligonucleotide that's a modified oligonucleotide that can be used, uh, and in this case, was initially was, was uh, proposed as a, an a activator, indirect activator of PPAR alpha. So again, manipulating metabolic pathways as a way of, again, slowing progression of disease. And as we've heard, there's a variety of different dietary uh, manipulations or dietary supplements that have been proposed or have been tested or are in the process of being tested in the course of PKD. And these, again, target either in the case of water intake, as we heard, the cyclic AMP pathway, caloric restrictions, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet. These are all targeting cellular metabolism pathways, and we'll hear about that again from Dr. Weems tomorrow. And then curcumin, which has got a variety of effects, um, uh, most 
or don't hold up in prolonged studies, but at least it's been proposed again, and it's been studied in AD, PKD in kids, and did not have benefit in terms of the vascular parameters that they were evaluating it in. So there are some translational challenges um, that, that have really, I think, that really uh, delay progress in this field and are going to be, and this is true not just for ADPKD, this is true of, of, again, clinical science in general, but in the context of PKD, we have challenges in interpreting the abnormalities of, of the late or moderate severe disease. As I said, the tissue is often late when we get it from individuals. Uh, it's difficult to know whether the changes that we're observing are causing pathology. Or are they, in fact, compensatory changes? And what I mean by that is in one of our animal models, we had identified the HNF4 pathway as being overactive, more active in cystic tissue. So we crossed our mice to an HNF4 knockout mice, expecting that we would at least make some positive benefit. And in fact, it went the other way. It did not have benefit. So again, just because something's up or something's down, it doesn't necessarily mean by knocking it down is going to be protective or giving it, making it go back up is going to be, uh, be uh, uh, therapeutic. So you just don't know until you've actually done the test. And then finally, analyses rarely correct for tissue heterogeneity. What I mean by that is if you have a disease in a model, for instance, where it's mostly in the distal part of the kidney and you grind up the entire kidney and then you look at a marker and you find its levels are up, compared to a normal kidney, you can't be sure that's because that the kidney, in fact, has an upregulation of that pathway versus it's just more of the tissue that you've just looked at has more of those cells as a fraction of the total thing that you've just homogenized. And so it, it can be difficult interpreting those sorts of studies. And our, our model systems are not, are not perfect. The mouse models are surprisingly good in the sense that they, you know, they, they, they do predict somewhat what goes on in humans, but some of the challenges are is, you know, how do you convert mouse years into human years? I mean, a mouse lives maybe two years. So what does four months delay in a mouse mean in terms of humans? Is, it that a, is that, again, a proportional increase in human time, or is it just four months or six months or eight months or whatever it is? So we don't really know, have a good way to benchmark that. The kinetics and pattern of gene activation in mice models are typically different than what we see in humans, where it's a stochastic process. And finally, the variability of disease is not often controlled for in these models. In almost every mouse model, there is significant variability in the presentation of disease, even when you think you've controlled for inbred strains, for, for, for reasons that we don't really quite fully understand. And so you really need large animal sets to be able to be really confident in a lot of these studies, and they often don't do that. Side effects of drugs are often rate limiting. Oops, sorry. And, uh, but, and then often, the, I mean, the other ultimate final thing of all of this is, of course, we're treating the consequences of mutation of PKD really rather than treating the underlying problem. And so that fundamentally means we're always going to be behind trying to catch up or, or slow down what something else is going on. So what about targeting the gene? Can we just target the gene and fix the thing that's broken? So go to the root cause of the disease. So here's a couple of strategies that one can think about when thinking about targeting the gene. You can try to replace its function with something else that does the same thing. You can try to improve its function, and that can, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go over this in more detail in over the next few slides. You can replace the mutant gene protein altogether, gene therapy, or you can try to correct the gene mutation by gene editing, and I'll go over these in turn. So what about replacing its function? Oops, sorry. So you heard from, from Dr. Watnick earlier, this is kind of the polycystin 1, polycystin 2 model. Um, PC1, you know, has this large end terminus, as you've heard. This gets cut, gets shed, it goes into exosomes, it goes into the urine. We don't know if it has function when it gets shed. Presumably it's not just doing nothing. There seems to be probably a purpose for it, but we don't know what it is. There's also the C terminus here that we've heard about. This has been shown to be cleaved and go off to the mitochondria. And also, it's been reported to go to the nucleus. And then finally, as we heard, PC1 and PC2 form some sort of channel complex. And so there may be activity coming through the channel. That's just in terms of ions. And so these could have different distinct functions of PKD1 and PKD2. It could be a multi multifunctional protein. On top of that, the PC1, PC2 complex have been localized to many different places within the cell. As we heard, it's in the primary cilium. It's also been described to be located at the, at, oops, sorry, at cell-cell um, junctions. It can be shown to be actually at the, basal, at the basal lateral membrane, so between the cells and the basement membrane at the bottom. And then finally, of course, as I said, part of it goes to control mitochondria. 
So which of these activities need to be replaced to potentially correct the mutant function? Which is dominant or are they all necessary to be able to have a, a perfectly healthy kidney? Well, a couple of studies done over the last few years suggest it might be simpler than we had worried that it to be. And the first result came from my lab a couple of years ago where we found that this C-terminus, a small CTT that we talked about, actually is released from PC1 and goes to mitochondria. That's just shown here. This is just staining on the bottom here with a marker for mitochondria, a marker for our protein, and you see that they very nicely go together in the same place in the cell. And those are mitochondria networks. Moreover, we showed just putting that little piece back into cells that lack PKD1 is able to fix um, uh, the, meta the mitochondria structural defect. So shown here on the top are the kidney cells from our PKD mice, where we have just a, a control thing put into the things, and the, the green is just our control protein. Red is, again, identifying mitochondria structure. And what you can see is the mitochondria are all little balls here. They're all broken up. And the bottom here is where we used our little terminus, C-terminus. Again, it's labeled with green. You can see that in the cell that expresses this, the mitochondria structure, instead of being little balls like it is up here on top, is actually got little worms, so it's like a network structure. So this was able to correct, just that little piece was able to correct the mitochondria network structure. Well, a study that just, oops, sorry. Yeah, a study that's in preprint, it hasn't come out yet, but was in preprint, has pushed this one level further. They have shown using a model where, in mouse model where they turned the gene off first and then they were able to turn on just the CTT itself in the same cells. They were able to show significant benefit in the in, a, in vivo model, suggesting not only does it just affect perhaps the mitochondria uh, structure, but in fact that effect on mitochondria structure and function may be enough to do many of the effects of PKD1. So it's a pretty striking and pretty surprising result. Why this is important therapeutically? Well, this is a pretty small piece of protein to make. This is something that could be amenable to a gene therapeutic approach in the future. And I'll come back to that a little bit further. So what about improving PC1 or PKD1 function or PKD2 function? So there's a couple different ways that people are thinking about how you could improve PKD function. One is to actually just increase PKD1 and PKD2 protein levels. And the second is to instead try to improve the function of a MUKD, mutant PKD protein. So let me just show you what I mean by that. So this is the normal situation, all right? There's the gene. It gets transcribed into an mRNA, and that gets made into protein. That's the standard situation. Now, in the context of PKD1, it turns out there was a sequence, the C-terminus, that in the mRNA, it's untranslated, but the sequence, which is a target for a microRNA, MIR-17. Now, why is that important? Well, because this MIR-17 binds to this PKD1 C-terminus and then causes it, uh, targets it for being degraded and um, blocks translation. So even though the message level may be okay, the amount of it that gets made into functional protein is reduced. And moreover, MIR-17 expression is upregulated in PKD because it's regulated by CMYK, which also goes up in PKD tissue. So theoretically, or what, this, what this study suggests, these results suggest, is that MIR-17 is kind of auto-regulating in a negative way. And in the context of a disease like ADPKD, where the re disease results from too little PKD1 or PKD2 activity, you can imagine that if you can increase one of the wild type allele, or if it's a mutant allele, but it's just a little bit broken, and you can get it up a little bit higher, that would be potentially beneficial. And so this is what the idea is. And in fact, there is a, uh, a drug, it's that antisense oligo that I told you about, that actually binds to MIR-17, prevents MIR-17 from binding to the target PKD1 or PKD2, and you get, therefore, an increase in protein expression. So that was in cells they were able to show that. Well, they then went and looked at this in animals. And this is a paper that was just uh, published just in August. So in this, in this case, what they did is they took the PKD1 mouse gene and they deleted the place where that MIR-17 should bind. And they did this in the context of a PKD1 um, conditional mouse. And what they can show here is 
Here's the mouse with a, uh, um, a mutant PKD1 that's missense and then a null allele. And here is when they put it in with this thing being deleted. And what you see is that the, it was, provides significant protection in this model. They found also, they knocked it out in the PKD2 gene. The PKD2 gene also has a MIR17 binding sequence. And if you knock it out in the PKD2 gene, in the context of a PKD1 mutant, just by increasing PKD2 expression, they saw a benefit in this mouse model. So they did this first with short-term treatment. Then they did develop this drug. I tested that drug, that oligo antisense that I told you about. They gave this to animals for a short term, and they showed benefit. They then gave it to the animals and watched them take it for a longer time, let the disease go further along. And in fact, that even showed benefit. Oops, sorry. So they looked at then Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And so the animals that received this dose of this drug Again, if they didn't receive it, you can see here in, in the orange, all dead by, just about all dead by, uh, by 60 days. Those animals that were treated here in the blue and in the uh, different, two different blue colors, they had significant protection by getting this, uh, this drug administered to them. And in fact, there's a trial in progress right now. Now again, the original point was to try to target PPAR, PPAR alpha because PPAR alpha expression also is regulated by MIR-17. This drug not only would presumably potentially affect metabolic pathways if it works, but also would be able to actually cause upregulation of PKD uh, protein expression, providing a second way means that whereby it might be beneficial. So can we improve mutant PKD protein function? And what I mean by that is there's a number, a lot of missense changes, as I said, that have a wide range of different effects. Some cause almost complete loss of, pro of, of activity, but some really just cause the protein not to fold properly. So for instance, in cystic fibrosis, a lot of the mutations are changes that have caused the protein. It's not completely missing. It's just, it doesn't work as well as it could be. And so a lot of the therapies that are developed for it, try to get it, you know, try to improve it by getting it to where it needs to be uh, on the cell. And so can we improve protein function? Well, shown here, is, on the, is in a cartoon form is what goes on normally. The PKD proteins are made in the ER. They traffic to the Golgi, which is here. In the process of going in the ER, they get things changed, modifications made to them. Things get added on, taken off uh, in terms of post-translational changes. And then in the Golgi, they get some additional changes. And once they have that, they then get on to the, pro they are able to go trafficking to where they need to be functional in the cell, whether that's the primary psyllium, the basal lateral membrane, wherever. So in the context, of missense changes, however, we have instead protein, and it's shown here in red, it's hard to see, but it's kind of crumpled up. So it's a little bit of a broken protein that doesn't work so well. And because it doesn't work so well, it doesn't make it out. It just gets sent to the, re to the recycling bin. So most of the mutant protein ends up in the recycling bin. Every now and then, a little bit gets up to the top. A little bit may be able to escape. And so the question is, can we make more of it escape? And so that's what's shown here. This is a drug or a compound that would be able to actually help the protein fold properly and then get, escape the UR, escape the Golgi, and go to where it needs to be. And so as you can see then, oops, sorry. Well, there we go. I'll skip that. There, are, there is, in fact, already right now in, pro, in progress a clinical trial looking at testing one of these corrector drugs that's being used. It was developed for, for cystic fibrosis. They're testing it now in PKD to see if, in fact, you could take some of those individuals who have missense proteins and potentially enhance their, their activity and reverse disease. So what about replacing the mutant gene and protein? This is kind of the idea behind gene therapy. And in, and in principle, it's really simple, right? You have a cell it's lacking the gene, because or it's got a gene, but it's broken, it's not working. Just put the gene back in and bingo, you now have formal replacement, and that would be a cure. Well, it's, 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 it's not so simple to do. Uh, and I'll explain in a minute why. But one of the other things we didn't know is if you gave it to somebody, let's say they already have cysts, you know, will, what will happen? Will it, will it be protective? Will it prevent further cysts from forming, or would it even reverse any cysts? Well, a recent clue to the potential uh, applicability of a genetic approach, a genetic therapy approach, came from a study published by Steve Somlow's group um, uh, last year. 
In this study, as shown here on the right, they took a PKD2 mutant model and they turned the gene off at about a month of age. And as shown here, what you can see is for about two months, nothing happens. This is something we reported back about 20 years, 15 years ago. There's a long lag time between turning the gene off in, a, in an adult mouse kidney and starting to see cysts. And we don't really fully understand why, but anyway, here it is. Goes on a couple of months, no cysts. Then, as you can see, by around the third month after the gene's been turned off, cysts begin to form and the kidney gets very, very large. So what he did in this model is he had those animals continue, let the gene just, I mean, let the mutation just do what it does, and then in another set of mice, he turned the PKD2 protein back on and asked what happens. And what he found, which was really nicely shown here, is actually the kidneys got smaller. It reversed the disease, suggesting that it's a really, really dynamic situation, at least in early disease. Oops, sorry. He showed this was true also in PKD1 kidneys. You do the same thing. Again, turning it on after the gene's been turned off, the animal's already cystic. This is what would happen if you, this is when you turn the, the turn the, put the gene back on, you what, did nothing. This is what would happen if you didn't have a gene. If you put the gene back in and turn it on, you rescued it. He then asked what happens if you waited even longer. I mean, so you turn it off, turn the gene off like you did before, put the gene on, and then just keep watching the animals for another three weeks. Because at this point, what happens is by week 19, these animals are really cystic. And what he found here is by putting the gene, turning it on and keeping it on, in fact, the disease was reversed, significantly reversed. However, the later you go in turning the gene on or the longer you let it go, the more fibrosis you have. And so you do have some injury. So it's not completely reversible, but if you get it early enough, the idea is that, in fact, you can actually prevent the disease from progressing very dramatically. So there are, as I said, though, challenges with gene therapy, and particularly for ADPKD. So one of the first challenges is thinking about how you're going to get the gene into the kidney cells. Most of the gene therapy trials that have been successful to date have been where they put it into the eye, so it's, it's, it's easily accessible and it's a protected environment, and that's been successful. Or it's been done with hematopoietic stem cells, where you can take them out, treat them in a dish, and then put them back to somebody, and then again, provide a cure. Um, that's not easy to do with kidney cells, right? How do you get this into every kidney cell, or even some of the most of the kidney cells? A second problem, specific to PKD1, is the gene is too large for most of the standard ways that people do gene therapy. So there's got to be something unconventional done to be able to get this into the, into the cell. So even if we had a good viral delivery system or any delivery system, we still have to figure out how we're going to get that really big thing into the cells. That's where that little CTT story that I told you becomes relevant, because that's a much easier thing. That'll fit in conventional systems. And so if we can figure out how to get it into cells, the CTT would be fine. Whoops, it's going to turn. Yeah, okay. Um, the other problem with sometimes with gene therapy is getting the correct expression. You've got to get it right, the right level. You don't want too much. You don't want too, level, too little. And you want it to be there for a long time. You want it to be there for the duration of the individual's life. And so again, this is sometimes been, can, has been a problem with some of the gene therapies, is they don't necessarily have proper regulation of, their, of the uh, levels, or they don't, they, the expression attenuates over time. And finally, the last thing is, that had been a problem in the past is making sure when you put something into the cells that you're, not, you're putting it in some place safe. You're not causing any disruption to any other genes. In fact, the early gene therapy trials back in the 90s, one of the problems, or early 2000s, one of the problems they had was actually it resulted in cancer in kids because it went into places where it caused growth pathways to be upregulated. So finally, how about correcting the gene mutation or, uh, you know, AK, you know, otherwise known as gene editing? So here's kind of the schematic, simplified schematic of what goes on in this. You really need just two things. You need a guide RNA which is targeting the sequence that you want to um, change. In this case, the little star there identifies where the mutation would be in a PKD gene. And you have Cas9 or a protein like Cas9. And that protein can bind DNA, RNA, and then has a cutting ability. And so if, what, if you can able to get it into the cell, it'll cause a cut as you show here where the X's are. Now, the, this, could be, this can resolve in two ways. One is called non-homologous end joining or end junction. That's shown here on the left. This is where basically it just kind of clips a little bit and takes the two things and fuses them together. It just kind of like glues them together. 
It doesn't really care what was on either side. It just sticks them together. As you might imagine, this is a great way to make mutations. It's not a great way to fix a specific mutation that you want to fix. So that is really not desirable. Instead, the other thing is called homologous directed recombination. Um, and in that case, you have a third element, and that is a stretch of DNA that is exactly the DNA sequence you want it to be. So let's say you have a base pair or two base pair mutation in the person's sequence. You would make a SIG RNA that targets that, and then you'd add a little piece of donor DNA that has the right sequence, and then when it fixes it, it rewrites it, and it corrects it. So it's a, it's a gene editing. So this is a, theoretically a great way to go. But there are, whoops, there are, uh, uh, no, that went too far. Ah, too fast. This is really second. So the advantage of this, of course, it fixes the root cause. You don't have to worry about gene regulation, permanence of, of solution. This is really, you've got it, one and done. There are some challenges still in this space. One, we still have to worry about off-targeting events because they still happen. It may not work well for very large or complex uh, rearrangements in the gene. So it's going to be may, may be somewhat mutation dependent. Um, the third thing, and this is really critical, is we have to get the guide RNA, the Cas9, and the correct template into all the same cells. Getting two out of three isn't good enough, because if you get the template, if you don't get the template in to every place where you get the guide RNA and the, and the Cas9 in, you're going to get mutations added, actually, rather than fixed. So this is a challenge that has to be done. And finally, personalized therapy. I mean, most people with PKD have unique mutations, so you may have to make one for each family, and that can be, again, a, a challenge. Finally, um, so, well, oh. So gene editing is the holy grail of corrective therapy, but I think it's still some bit in the future. But at least there's exciting evidence that suggests that if we were able to do it, uh, even early stage ADPKD, we might not we might be able to reverse the early cysts and in fact provide a, a lasting cure. So some conclusions: short term, most therapeutic options will likely come from treating altered downstream pathways. I think emerging new insights um, may, after, uh, may offer intermediate hopes of treatments that either replicate PKD1, PKD2 function, uh, boost their levels, or correct the effects of missense changes uh, that reduce their function. Recent studies suggest that PKD is reversible if caught early. And finally, true cures based on gene therapy or gene editing will take some time as we work out all on efficient and safe delivery systems. And so uh, in terms of quizzes, so this is, so I, I, I did it a little bit differently than everybody else, it appears. So I made a series of um, uh, one question, then you have multiple true-false options. And so there's no number of, true, there's no absolute numbers of trues and falses here. Well, there is an absolute number, but there's, uh, there's, there's five elements to this one particular question, and there's another question with five elements. So I don't know how you want to do this. Can, Okay. Oh, you do? Okay. So they're going to have, they can just put true false for each one of these? Oh, so you have an option. So I didn't realize I would have made it so hard. But they're easy questions. I'll be a generous, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be a generous grader. Um, so just to, for those, who, uh, a better management of individuals living with ADPKD over the past 30 years has significantly delayed onset of end-stage kidney disease in most. Is that true? What do you think? No? Yeah. Clinical presentation of ADPKD poses both opportunities and challenges for therapeutic development. Therapeutic choices may depend on the degree of disease severity, an individual's age, and the tolerability of a treatment. See, these are like low-ball questions, right? <laughs> Therapies directed at downstream pathways are more likely to be brought into practice in the short term. It is highly likely that pathways found up regulated in ADPK tissue, AD, ADPKD tissue are contributing to the pathology of the disease, and treatments directed at blocking them will be affected, effective. Okay, do we have any from the audience? Sure. I think that's right. I <laughs> can't remember the questions, but I think that's right. 
<laughs> I think I built it. I think I did it like false, and then a bunch of trues, and then false. But I mixed it up this time. The next one. There we go. We go back to the second quiz. Okay, quiz two. Yep. Come on, Beck. Come on. There we go. So which of the following are true statements regarding treatments directed at the root cause of ADPKD? In most cases, mutations reduce PKD function, so therapies must be directed at improving or replacing PKD gene function. What do you think? All right. Okay. Gene editing or gene therapy can provide a lasting cure that may last the lifetime of an individual. Hopefully. <laughs> Now that we know that disease is reversible if caught early, we can move ahead with starting gene therapy clinical trials. <laughs> Again, I told you, it's a low bar. Drugs that increase expression of either PKD1 and or PKD2 may be effective treatments. The primary obstacle for developing, uh, to developing treatments retarding, targeting the underlying gene defect in ADPKD resulting from mutations in PKD1 is the size of the PKD1 gene. And strategies used to treat cystic fibrosis may also be effective in treating some forms of ADPKD. Want to pull up the results? I can't remember what the questions are now. Oh, they're still coming. Okay. Can't see those very well. There we go. I have to read it over here myself. So uh, the answer number one should have been true, right? Uh, number two should have been true. Gene editing should be a long-term therapy. I uh, can't read what third one is. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can't go ahead with clinical trials quite yet. There's still a lot of problems with, it, with gene therapy to work out, so I would say that's not true. Um, things that um, uh, increase expression can be, can, can, can be effective in some cases. That's true. Um, the primary obstacle is not the gene size, because we could always use the CTT. The primary obstacle is getting it into the cells in an effective way. Uh, delivery is a problem. And the last one was um, uh, cystic fibrosis treatments. And that, was, that is true, as I said in one of the last slides. That that's a, a, may, be, may be effective in some people. So anyway, thank you very much.